Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Logan's Devotions. Great to be together. Wonderful to open up God's Word for another day and see what he has to say. We're going to be turning through to Romans chapter 11 again and looking at verse 28 through 36. But before I read that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you have made us your children. And we pray that as we read your word that we would hear your voice and see clearly what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned to all consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how unscrutable his ways. For he has known the mind, who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counsellor, or who has given a gift to him, that he might be repaid. For from for him, sorry, for from him, and through him, and to him, are all things. To him be glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, for the last two chapters, chapter nine. Well, three chapters, I guess, chapter 9, 10, and 11, we've been looking at kind of the same theme in a whole bunch of different ways. As though Paul has held up a diamond before us regarding God's mercy, and he has twisted it and twisted it and twisted it and twisted it and looked at the 63 different edges of the diamond. And we've just looked at a few of those. But as we've seen that and learned a whole bunch of different points, here we now get to the nugget of what it's all about. At the end of the day, having said all that Paul has said in chapter 19 and 11, what do we now say? How do we summarize it? How do we bring it all together so that we understand the totality of the argument? Well, Paul effectively, effectively says three things. Firstly, he speaks about the Jews, the Israelites. Secondly, he speaks about the Gentiles. And then thirdly, he tells us what that means. So firstly, speaking about Israel, he says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So at the end of the day, as you summarize everything, we recognize some really important truths. Firstly, Israel Israel were our enemies for the sake of the gospel. They were hardened, they stumbled, they disbelieved, they persecuted Gentiles, all of that sort of stuff. For the sake of the gospel coming to everyone. It's all within the control of God. But even though... For the sake of the gospel, they were enemies. For the sake of election, they were beloved. Because their forefathers were a part of the family of God. In other words, because of what God has done in their forefathers, they remind us of the beautiful love of God. But but the calling of God is irrevocable and his gifts. You see, the hardening, the stumbling, the giving of grace, the giving of mercy... It can't be changed because it's according to the sovereign plan of God, according to his ways, according to his works. And so it cannot be changed. That is the way that God conceived it to take place. Whether you or I think it was wise or good makes no difference because his ways are higher than our ways. So firstly, he acknowledges the summary of everything he said about Israel that they were hardened and they became enemies for the sake of the gospel. But then he says, what about the Gentiles? 
You were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. It says, look, Gentiles, at the end of the day, you were disobedient. You were outside the covenant of grace so that mercy might come to you through the Jews receiving mercy. The Jews were disobedient, which led to the mercy coming to the, is, to the Gentiles, as we've seen. And so how do we understand that? We understand it as the reality that God consigns all to disobedience and shows mercy to all. In other words, there's no one who doesn't stand under the reality of disobedience. All have fallen short of the glory of God, Jew and Gentile alike. There's no one that stands obedient before God, not needing his mercy, but all stand as disobedient sinners, worthy of the wrath of God, deserving of hell, deserving of eternal punishment. And yet, God has equally shown mercy on all. Of course, he doesn't mean by that he's saving everybody. but He has made the way of mercy open. God has consigned the path to glory through mercy. He could have done what he wanted, and he did. And the way he decided to bring about salvation was through the hardening of Jews, through the belief of Gentiles, and all of that by God's sovereign mercy. You know, people get all upset about the idea of a sovereign God showing mercy on whom he pleases. But would you rather have it a different way? Would you rather it depend upon you? I sure wouldn't. I know my ability. I know my stickability. And if it was based on me, there would be no hope. And yet God in his sovereign love and mercy says, I'm going to make a way. And it's the path of mercy, the path of grace, the path of Christ. So the Israelites are summarized, the Gentiles are summarized. And then lastly, Paul shows us what this all means. What do we do with it? What do we do with chapters 9, 10, and 11? What should it generate inside of us? What should it cause? Have a look at verse 33. Paul soars into the heights of worship. He says, reflecting, you know, he's reflecting upon the truth that he's just stated. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And he says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. In other words, you can never comprehend what God is doing and has done and will do. He says, for quoting the Old Testament, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. See, Paul sees the immense mercy of God and his path and way of salvation and he just reflects upon the majesty of it. He reflects upon the fact that he as a mere human can never understand it. No one can. We can never plumb the depths of it. We can never comprehend the breadth of it. We can never see into the totality of it. We are limited and finite in our understanding, but God is not. God knows every possibility that could be and divined a path for his ways. And so, Verse 36, from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, everything has its start in God. Everything is carried out through God and everything is done for God. So that he would be maximally glorified. At the end of the day, that is the teaching of Romans 1 through 11. 
You see, we're just about to hit a huge turning point in Romans, where Paul shifts from the indicative to the imperative. He shifts from who we are to what we should do. That's just about to take place. And it's as though Paul looks back at all 11 chapters that he's written and says, at the end of the day, the hardening of hearts, the rejection of the gospel, the rebellion of Gentiles, the depth of depravity of the world, the glorious salvation offered through Christ, all of it is summarized in, to him be glory forever, amen. And so where we should land at the end of 11 chapters is awe, worship, and humility. Awe, worship, and humility. We should be left dumbfounded, filled with awe at the reality of what God has achieved. We should be caused to bow down in humble worship before our God. And we should be filled with humility that this God would condescend to this world and save us. What a saviour. To the praise of his glorious grace is what this is all about. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you've done. Would you fill us with awe, worship, and humility? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow.